Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday and welcome to Disrupt Your Now with me, your host, Lisa Kipps Brown. I'm happy tonight to have Dave Van Buskirk with me. He has been with Edward Jones for many years and has worked with tons of entrepreneurs. So through his own entrepreneurial journey and clients, he's seen it all, done it all. <laughs> you know, seeing all the mistakes that we can make and but also the good things that can come out of what we do. So Dave, I want you to introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about your background and and how you got to where you are and then we'll take it from there. Sure. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, yes, um, I've been with Edward Jones for 20 years, actually this month. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it'll, it'll also be 20 years uh, that uh, I will be married in August as well. Ooh, nice. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good year. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2001 was a good year, but uh, prior to joining Edward Jones, I was in telecom for about 10 years. I always knew that I was going to do this, but just uh, really when I graduated from Villanova university in 1990, did not have uh, necessarily the confidence to go and, and do something like this and be mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. Um, and thank goodness I went to the corporate world for those years. I learned a lot. Uh, made a, a ton of great friends and relationships and that really uh, actually helped me quite quite a bit coming into this profession yeah it does help to learn the corporate world even when you can't stand it like me it helps to learn about the relationship building and the systems and stuff and you can see what you like what you don't like and then kind of adapt it i want to ask you before you go further, you said you always knew you would do this. Did you, do you mean Edward Jones specifically or be a financial investment advisor? That, that That's a great question. No, I, I did not know uh, it was going to be Edward Jones. I, on the way, I uh, almost went to a couple of other companies, went, went but I, I learned about Edward Jones and the culture and mm -hmm. visited a couple offices. And thank goodness that uh, when I applied, they accepted me. But I, I um, the reason that I knew that I wanted to do this goes back to I don't know the exact day. I'm I'm pretty sure I was 13 years old. I do know where it was, and it was at my grandparents' house on Southside Drive in Owego, New York. Okay. And um, my grandfather worked at IBM mm -hmm. for his entire career. Uh, I overheard them talking about their IBM stock mm -hmm. and I asked my grandmother if she could tell me a little more about that. And sh so she, she pulled out a ledger that had every transaction, every share of IBM stock that they bought through the company stock purchase plan. Wow. What was funny was that my grandfather knew of, that he was able to do this plan, but they had four kids. And he didn't think they could afford to buy any stock. Well, my mm -hmm. grandmother learned about it and said, I'm going to go and get a job part time. And every dollar I make, we're going to put it into that IBM stock. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Yeah, there, there, you, there are. But That's she had, cool. Yeah. And she had the foresight to know that the, the pension was awesome and Social Security is going to be there for them, but they needed to save money. And so yeah. it was from her. She was my really big influence when I was younger. And from there, it, it turned into subscribing to Money Magazine when I was a kid and just. Oh, that's it. funny. Most kids are like, how can I spend my money? And you're interested in learning about investing. Yeah. I, I saw I saw that ledger and it was amazing what happened over there. Yeah. A little bit away and being consistent with it and sticking to the plan. What could happen? You know, uh, I don't, I don't want to get off of your story, but my aunt is 86 now and I've been helping my cousin take care of her the past several years. And of course, you know, that's extremely expensive and she's running out of money. And my aunt was, my cousin was like, I know that daddy bought some Vepco stock. Now that's now Dominion, Virginia power, but it was called Vepco when we were growing mm -hmm. up. Yeah. She's like, I know he bought some Vepco stock but I don't know where it is. She just remembered that when she was in college, he was all excited and he had bought like maybe a hundred dollars worth of stock, 75 or a hundred. And he was all excited and he was telling her and he's like, but I don't know how I get my dividends, you know? And she's like, and he showed her some, she's like, I don't know. I'm just in college. What do I know? And he was a blue collar worker. He worked for Burlington industries 
-hmm. had worked his way up to supervisor. Anyway, she's like, I know daddy bought that stock and maybe it's worth a little bit. Turns out we found it. He, the reason he didn't know how to get the dividends is he had set it up for it to be reinvested. Yeah. And he died, I think in 1993 and he had bought it not that long before that, maybe four or five years. But yeah. so it sat in that account the whole time and it ended up being worth over $70,000. Whoa. And he had bought it directly from the company. So, yeah. cause we're like, wow, this is weird. And she took it to her investment advisor. And he goes, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. This is literally from the company. So all he had to do was, they basically contacted the company, the company sent him a check, you know, and it was so wild, but it, it was a great lesson. And we thought, how awesome is that, that he did that. And now it's helping Kate take care of his wife. Of course, he didn't know he would die at 49, you know? Yeah. But, oh yeah, that's, that's a great story. So the dividend, his dividends reinvesting are similar to what you said about your grandma constantly buying. That's right. That's right. Cause the dividend pays every quarter mm -hmm. and buys more shares that every yeah. time it pays out. That's awesome. So when you're a kid, you're buying money magazine and studying it and learning about how money works. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. And then, yeah, when I went to undergrad, I, I, at Villanova, I majored in finance and took every investment class I could. And then even when I was working in telecom, uh, in my twenties, I, I went for my master's at Elon university in North Carolina. Oh yeah. Elon's not far from us. Yeah. I didn't think so. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I took again, every investment class I could take just, just preparing for, for doing what I'm doing today. That's awesome. I was an accounting major and you know, I took finance, but you just take bas basic finance. And of course you just take basic marketing and, I really, as an older person now, I feel like, man, I really wish that we had been taught more about marketing, more about finance. I definitely wouldn't have gotten an accounting degree if I had a, but you know, <laughs> I thought it was boring and, um, but I, and I was really good at accounting, but then ended up hating that when I actually did it. But, you know, yeah. I don't feel like the intro is enough for college kids to understand if unless there's somebody like you that's already been exposed to it, it's not really enough for us to learn what we like and don't like. I, I totally agree. And all this stuff should be taught to kids when they're younger. Yeah. It, it's crazy. We, have, we can't graduate high school without knowing the difference between a sign and a cosine, but we know, don't know how to balance a checkbook. It's just exactly. Yeah. When I was in high school, they actually taught us that in like, it was like a, history class or social studies. It was like a, maybe a 10th or 11th grade mm -hmm. and I, probably 11th or 12th grade. And I remember it was a weird class for it to be in, but, and I don't know if our teacher was supposed to be, but she actually taught us about checkbooks and ha you know, how to write a check. I already knew because my mother had told, shown us, but there are a lot of people that even after they're adults, they know how to write a check, but they don't know how to balance a checkbook. And That's it's right. crazy, isn't it? That's right. Okay. So you went to college and then, and then you got your graduate degree from Elon and then what you did? Yeah. Then it was just a, then, then I, after that point, I moved down to where I am now, which is, uh, we live in Grapevine, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, the office is in Irving. And, uh, from, yeah, from here, uh, met my wife a couple of years later. And as soon as, as soon as I knew that, uh, we were going to get married. I talked to her about what I really wanted to do for my career. And uh, before we even got married, I, I was able to get on with Edward Jones at that point. That's great. And like I said, what a, what a year it was. Yeah. It, yeah. And tell them about the year so they understand what you mean. Yeah. So it was, uh, so if we go back to 2001, I, I started studying in May. Uh, then I got my series seven and it took after training and then you go and you're officially licensed. So the second day I was able to actually open an account was September 11th. Man. So I, and, and so I was out uh, meeting, meeting people. I was actually with my sitting with my mentor that morning. And we actually, after we watched everything that was going on and I, I helped him send all kinds of letters to his clients 
Mm -hmm. uh, he said, um, you know what, let's go out and go meet some people. So we went around the neighborhood and actually knocked on doors and, and uh, everybody wanted to talk then. You know, that, that's really, I think that's a great lesson because 99.9% .9 of people would have said, well, they would have either been glued to the TV like I was, yeah. or they would have said, oh, no, we can't go talk to people. They're going to be afraid. But the fact that y'all went out and were human faces that people could look at yeah. and just go talk, you know, and reach out and so that they could have somebody friendly to talk with, it probably was really reassuring for them. Yeah, it, it, it was amazing. People couldn't believe it. And they really appreciated what we were doing, too. And uh, he was an amazing mentor. He's one of my best friends today, actually. But he's taught me a lot of good lessons, that's for sure. That's great. That, that was the first, I would say. Yeah, th that is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lesson. And then you, so 20 years, there was that. Then there was 2008 crash, right? Yes, yes. So, right. So since I've been doing this, we really have gone through uh, my clients and I and, and my team. Yeah. Uh, the the two biggest corrections in the stock market since the Great Depression. Yeah. And it's crazy yeah. because, you know, when we were growing up, the you know, we'd read about the Great Depression, see movies, hear about it. But it's kind of seemed like this big thing that, you know, almost like a movie, like it would never happen again. Right. That's and then right. we see ourselves going through what we've been through. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And in, in times like that, uh, you know, we just, we, we, you know, on our team and with my family too, we just continue to focus on relationships and we think mm -hmm. that's the key to getting through tough times like that. Yeah. And, and I know that you probably have a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners as your clients. Yes. So you need to be there for them to, to, to not just help them with oh, buying stocks or whatever, but I'm sure you've acted as an advisor to them for their own business, right? How to survive and grow and thrive. Yeah. And it, I think it, it gets easier and easier the longer I'm doing this uh, from the wisdom and things I've learned from clients and, and from having my own business mm -hmm. and also from all the coaching that I've done over the years. I, I've been, I think I've had a coach in, in some form for 19 years of doing the business. Uh, I, I've had a couple of them for, you know, consistently one, one in particular strategic coach out of Chicago for mm -hmm. the past 14 years and worked with others along the way too. But yeah, in, any, anything that, that I learn from, from there that, that I can share with other entrepreneurs, I, I want to do it. Hopefully we'll be able to do a little bit of that today too. Yeah, yeah, hopefully so. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. That's one thing that I waited way too late for. I mean, it wasn't too late, but too long, too long for like, why didn't I have a coach? And I think quite frequently we entrepreneurs, it's like you think of a coach as for sports. So why do I need a coach? You know, and now I'm like, how did I live without a coach? You know, and so I think that that's a, a great point that you bring up. So anybody out there listening, if you don't have a coach, please consider looking into finding one or joining a mastermind or something like that, because you really do need somebody or some people that you can lean on and get objective advice from. And the other key thing is people who understand where you are and where you've been, because other people who are not entrepreneurs cannot, they're the worst people to go to, to, to try to talk about things. Yeah, they, they, they might be better as mentors sometimes, but not not necessarily for coaching. Right. That, yeah, because great. if you haven't gone through it, you just don't know. And it, you know, somebody who hasn't been an entrepreneur is typically going to be less risk or more risk adverse, and so they just can't understand. Well, why don't you just quit and get a job? You yeah. know, that's what most people would say. Well, just quit and get a job, and rather than real working through advice that another entrepreneur could give. Yeah. And you've probably found through the coaching that you've done that it's not an expense. No, it isn't. It's an investment, right? It, it is. Yeah. And that's a hard thing when people first start doing it, you know, all they see is the expense and this money going out, but no, it's way, way, way. You get so much more out of it unless you get a terrible coach. But, and yeah. that's the other key thing, you know, Dave, 
that it's really important to find the right coach for the right person because everybody has a different personality. I look at it like dating, you know, okay. everybody's not supposed to date everybody. You right. have to find the right match. And so whether it's a coach or a mastermind or whatever, you need somebody that appreciates you and the way that you communicate and the way that you think and can, can really understand you so that they can help you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if it's, if it's not the right fit, just like dating, you're wasting your time. That's right. <laughs> There's and, other people out there for you. <laughs> yeah. And if they're a great coach and they realize they're not the right fit, they can recommend you. They can refer you to somebody they think is a better coach. Just like if you go, Oh, well, you might like my friend <laughs> to date, you know, it really is because it is yeah. relationships, but yeah. coaching is such a personal thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and the more, I don't know if you found this, but the more and it's it's not just money, it's time too. But the yeah. more time I invest in it, and the more money I invest in it, it's just it, it's it's made I'll say my whole world happier, yeah. and 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 the business just grows and grows. The more the more we invest in it, the more we grow. It's just amazing. And what so can about, you give yeah. to anybody in the audience who hasn't had a coach before, or maybe has one in it? they don't feel like it's worth it. Can you give us a couple of examples of like maybe things that you've learned besides like, I mean, I think it's awesome that that man said, okay, on nine 11, let's go out, let's go door to door. Yeah. That's a great lesson, but you know, maybe big picture things or specific yeah. problems that you had. Yeah. And there, there's one thing that's, that's come from, well, yeah. And, and relating to some, uh, maybe some hurdles we had to overcome. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of, and it, as an entrepreneur and, and it's just life, we're all going to have these obstacles. And uh, some of the things that I've learned through coaching have really helped. And over the past few years, we've, we've had a few things going on um, in our life. Our oldest daughter uh, was, was really sick. She had these incredible headaches that we didn't know what was going on and she couldn't get rid of them. And, a lot of time in the hospital, had to miss a lot of school mm. and that kind of thing will rock your world. And I'm not saying our problems are worse than anybody else's. No. I just, we, we all can relate though. I think yeah. like, the story, uh, you know, my staff, um, two of them wanted to become financial advisors, which I absolutely supported, but yeah. I lost my right and left arm when that happened. But you know, and you have to rebuild. Yeah. Rebuild when that happens. Uh, I had, uh, my, uh, on each knee, I had a knee surgery uh, uh, over the past two years. That takes you out for quite a while. My my dad uh, passed away here in January, and it, it was a surprise. He had a heart attack. He had the Widowmaker heart attack. And, oh, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you. But, you know, um, through it all, though, it was going back to a lot of the things that I learned from the, the coaches that were very important to me. And one, one of the things I think, and, and it was everyone actually has – some type of a, of a point about this mm -hmm. and it's, it's about taking time every day to recognize your wins. Yes. So, um, it could be, it could be anything. It, it could be as simple as not hitting snooze mm -hmm. at one o'clock. It, it could be having a great appointment with a client. It could be making a prospect a client. It could be that you exercise that day. I mean, it could be anything, but what I found that, uh, because again, I, none of these ideas have come from my own head. They're always from someone else helping me out. But um, there's one of my coaches in particular that really talks about gratitude a lot. Yeah. And so when thinking about those those wins and the things that happen that you know you're 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 proud of yourself for it, that makes you feel good. That gives you confidence. But also daily, when you're especially when you're going through tough times, is writing down people that you're grateful for. Yeah. And those and those relationships that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, at, at the beginning of the day, I, I'm not perfect at this, but I try to do it quite often is not just write down what I'm looking forward to during the day. But who am I grateful for? Yeah. Uh, That's what Justin Breen does on LinkedIn. Y'all, he, he's actually who introduced us. So, yeah, right. every day on LinkedIn, um, Justin does his grateful journal. And I think that's really cool because he can go back at any time. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, if you're having a down day or whatever, 
Yep. You know, if you can go back, it really puts things in perspective, doesn't it? It does. It does. And and something else that I think is very important if you if you can practice this too is working on being more present. Mm-hmm. And think about everything that's happened over the past little over a year and how many people really need that in their lives right now. Mm -hmm. So um, it's asking that one extra question before you let the the client or prospect go. And, and, and hopefully it's about themselves, you know, it's learning a little more about the person, Mm -hmm. but but it's just, it's trying to set yourself up in your environment so that you don't have on, um, interruptions that your, you know, your phone is not mm-hmm. right by you buzzing that it's turned off, that it's, it's turned over Yeah, There's little things that you can put into place to be more present with people because you do care, but there's all these distractions. You, are, you have something else that you're worried about. You're doing later on, but uh, right now more than ever, people appreciate when you are more present. That's so true. Yeah. We, and we need it more now than ever. I mean, yeah, and and that's one of the good things that I think has come out of COVID is that it has made us realize that we need each other. Mm-hmm. You know, so many people, oh, I don't need anybody, whatever. And just going through what we've gone through, we realize we do need that human emotional connection. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, one one more thing is just trying to, practice gratitude in every interaction that you have. Yeah. And when, you know, just every interaction we, when, when someone calls our office, we want them to feel better because they called us or just make them just a little bit happier because they were able to call us that day. Mm -hmm. We got to talk to them and we say, thank you for everything. Yeah. They, they could be calling to ask where they, they think they're asking us a favor. And then we say, no, that we'll say, thank you. And so, no, thank you. You helped me. No, no. <laughs> you chose us to call. Right. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. So you're, you're reversing the mindset. Yep. Yeah. The gratitude and appreciation over and over and mm-hmm. over. Those and things. Then, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say when, you know, those, those three things, if you practice those those three things that that we've learned, mm-hmm. it just it makes an incredible uh, difference in your relationships and, and, be, and helping you being able to lean into those relationships when things aren't going so well. You don't have to tell everybody what's wrong or anything like that. But it's just amazing. You know, you're you're there for them, too. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you know, if you're running a business. Your people love you, your, your clients love you and, and, and they want you to be there for them as well. And, so and, they're, and they're, they're there for you, even though they don't necessarily know it. Yeah. And it just, it, it, it can take a, a, a tough situation and have you come out, not just surviving, but thriving when it's mm-hmm. over. One of my friends, you may know him, Richard Mulholland in South Africa, founder of Missing Link Presentation Powerhouse. He oh. said a couple of things to me, has in the past said a couple of things to me that remind me of things you said. And one is that every day he has a new day resolution. He doesn't Mm -hmm. believe in a new in New Year's resolutions every day. And it might be something really tiny or it might be something not to do. But at the end of the day, he has that one thing, that new day resolution. And he gives himself either a victory sign emoji or the smiling poop emoji. (laughs) And I laugh. I'm like, even if you get the smiling poop, it still makes you you can't feel bad, you know, because you're you're like, oh, I'll just keep going. So he he said that that's the daily thing. But he also talking about growth and how, you know, so many businesses just grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have a target. We don't really know what we're growing for. And we're just doing what everybody else is doing or think bigger, bigger, bigger. And he he says talks about it as being the victory condition. Yep. Know your victory condition and understanding like your own personality yep. and how you interact with your business. And he was telling me he loves board games and he realized that his brain like needed to be in solve mode and his business is like 25 years old. So it's like cruising altitude. It's going great. And he was playing board games like every day. And he realized that it was because he was bored, B-O-R-E-D, <laughs> but that's yeah. why he was playing board games. 
Then when COVID came and the bottom fell out of his business because of the kind of business it was, all of a sudden, because he was so entrenched in that and turning it around, he realized I'm not playing any board games and I'm more excited than I've been in years. And, and he realized that the board games could be his canary in the gold mine for the future. That if he, not that he never wants to play them, but if he saw himself playing more and more and more, it would help him have that early warning that you're getting complacent, you're getting bored. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And I think, I think too many of us don't pay enough attention to our own personalities and our own quirks and the things we like and don't like. And I think it's because we're so busy working and a lot of us think, oh, that's just like new age, whatever. But by ignoring those things, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice because the more we understand ourselves and how we're motivated, why we're motivated, what we want out of life, I just feel like that helps us make better business decisions for that are better for us personally. Yeah. I totally agree. And don't, you know, it, yeah, if you're made, if you have a certain makeup, don't go against it, go with it. Yeah. You use yeah. your, take your unique uniqueness and try to, you know, focus on that. Yeah. Embrace it and embrace figure it. out even, the, even things that some people would think might be negative about you, you can make them a positive in some way sure, or some type of client. Yeah. Um, and, and I also think a lot of times some of the things that might seem like the worst things in life can end up being the things that you learn the most from. Absolutely. And you mentioned that it, specifically, you know, about the market stuff, but I bet there's other things in life. I'll give you an example for myself. Yep. Um, my father was blind. And it wasn't until I grew up, I mean, you know, we just didn't think about him as being blind because he was just daddy, you know. So we didn't really think about, you know, he owned a wood shop with a lathe in our basement and he, um, you know, rode horses, shotguns, played basketball with us, all kinds of stuff that we just took for granted because he was just daddy. Mm -hmm. And we knew there were three of us girls and we knew we did things that most girls didn't do. We had to around the house kind of things that usually boys would do. So we knew that, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized that him being blind and me watching him adapt to do things that he shouldn't have been able to do. Oh yeah. That taught me how to think differently. I didn't even realize I was thinking differently, but it taught me to just not accept, you know, the standard way. And I, but I think everybody has things like that in our life. And there's so much a part of our makeup that we don't realize it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, what, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's right. That's like right. Song. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite like experiences or something with, with entrepreneurs that you've worked with where maybe they've learned a lesson or had a great turnaround or something? Oh, if you can I, talk about it. And I totally understand if you can't. Yeah. Uh, Probably. Well, so I, uh, in addition to being a financial advisor, I was a regional leader for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And and so it, what I, what that, that role is, it's really being a super mentor for other financial advisors in the area. Yeah. So I, I, I would say, you know, we, we definitely have seen those people who are, I mean, it could be in this industry, any industry, but where they're going through certain struggles uh, out of the gate, and, and probably a lot of times, like you're saying, not, not embracing their uniqueness mm -hmm. and not being themselves and, and letting their, just letting their, um, you know, their hard, hard, hard workers, but um, maybe sticking to the script a little too much or, yeah. or, or to what someone else thinks that. The, yeah, it, that's, I think that's a huge, yes, and, that's a huge thing. Instead of just being themselves and, um, and, and and relying on their instincts and, and speaking from the heart to, to convince people mm -hmm. to work with them. Yeah. And, 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 not, and, and, and being really um, more a problem solver mm -hmm. in, in, instead of someone that pushes products. Yeah. And I, and I think that, I mean, I've, I've seen that over and over again with entrepreneurs Yeah. that, that, that I've helped or that, that, that I've, that I've known mm -hmm. going to the, um, 
changing the mindset to being out there as someone who can solve a problem for someone and, and them being the solution. Yeah, there's a huge difference between that and selling a product because anybody can sell a product. Yeah. But not everybody has that knowledge and experience. And a lot of the things people can't even be taught because it's natural or, you know, cumulative over a life, you know, different life experiences right. combined. That's right. And all, also um, not worrying so much. Yeah. I said, that's easy for you to say, I'm just joking. But so do you have any, some of the tips that you gave earlier kind of are related to that, but do you have any specific tips that you use to help yourself not worry so much? I, I do. And I, and I am, I, 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 I am still a worrier. I mean, that, that that's just my makeup, but, uh, I do keep a quote on my board behind me from Tom Petty from a Tom Petty song that says, I'm, I'm going to read it. So I don't, I, I okay. it exactly right. Most things I worry about never happen anyway. Yes. All right. Yes. So I, I just love that. And it is, if you think about it, it is so true. It is true. But one, one thing I, I, one um, thing I learned through coaching that you may have heard about uh, was the gap. Did you ever hear about staying out of the gap? I've heard it, but I don't really remember. So, yeah, yeah. so and, you, and I think it is, it is a little bit about worrying, but it's also something that you mentioned earlier about the uh, victory syndrome. I think you call yeah. it the victory condition. Know your victory condition. Yeah. So uh, as entrepreneurs, at, whenever we hit a new milestone or we, mm -hmm. we set a goal for ourselves and we hit it, it's on to the next goal. Right. And it's always this constant, what's next, what's next, what's next. And it could, it can at some point make us a little frustrated because we're not where we want to be. Yeah. Or we see that someone else is there where mm -hmm. we want to be, but we're not there yet. Yeah. But if, so the, the gap is all of those things that um, happen that have been fantastic for us along the way. And, it, and it's making sure that you're not measuring forward all the time that look, looking forward and having a goal that that's awesome, but don't forget to look back from where you came. Yes. And acknowledge and, and acknowledge con congratulate that. yourself for everything that you've achieved. Yes. Cause, cause when you do look back, you, you, you look back and see where you started. It could mm -hmm. be or a few months ago where a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago to where you are right now. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm sure anyone who's on here, if, if they do that, even look back to last year to where they are today, it's, and we don't take time to think about that. That's right. But it's yeah. so that, that keeps you out of the gap. That's a great point. And yeah, it, that's similar to what, it, you know, is related to what he was talking about with the victory condition, because he was like, if you don't know what your victory, like when you will have won, if you don't really know what you want out of life in your business, then you just keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. And he said, and that's cancer. Like, mm -hmm. oh. you know, but we don't think about it like that. We just think, grow, grow, grow. My company needs to be bigger. Yep. The, the reason I'm looking down, I don't want it to seem like I'm being rude, but I had a quote that I wanted to share with you that's similar to the one that you just had, but I have to find it. And okay. I have a billion photos on my phone. And of course I don't organize them like I should. So it's going to take me a minute. Okay. But um, and if I can't find it in a minute, I'm just gonna say it kind of like how I remember it. Wait a second, if that's not it. Um, shoot, where is it? Um, sorry. The reason I wanted to find the picture is, here it is. Sir Anthony Hopkins said this. Now, there may have been other people that have said it similar, but right. the article that I read it in or whatever was him. And he says, today is the tomorrow you were so worried about yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, it does that. And tell me your, the Tom Petty one again. Most things I worry about never happen anyway. Yes. It, it, it's just we worry and we worry and we worry. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that is a habit, don't you? Yes. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And yeah, you're, that's a really good point. And 
some habits, uh, they get worse and worse the longer you don't recognize. <laughs> yeah, and I think, <laughs> sometimes, I think sometimes we think, oh, I have to worry because if I don't worry, I'm not doing my job. You know, I'm not being prepared, but there's a difference in actually worrying and in strategizing and planning and being prepared. Right, right. And the nice thing is, is that so many people have done it for, uh, just have done it before that you can rely on. That's Those, right. The coaches, the mentors, that's not exactly in your business, but mm -hmm. they, um, a lot of people have been there before. And again, it's, it's going back to leaning on your best relationships. Yep. And they're the shortcuts. They're yep. the shortcut through the woods so that you can get to where you're going faster with having to, you know, take so much time and be so tired. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I really wish that I had hired a coach so many years before I did. I just never just didn't realize I needed it. And I mean, it was really dumb, but you know, I'm like, ah, Tiger Woods needs a coach. That's it. The best to have a coach. Yeah, exactly. Ron James, he's the best basketball player right now. I think most people would agree. And he's mm -hmm. never been without a coach. And some people have multiple coaches. That's the other thing. I, because yeah. let's, if you think about it from a sports analogy, okay, if you're playing golf, you have to be good at putting, but you also have to be good at driving and chipping and everything else, they're different skill sets. So you might need a different coach for each thing. Yeah. So business is the same way that you might need to look at having several coaches. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I imagine most CEOs in the Fortune 1000 companies have multiple coaches too. Yeah, I bet they do. Yep. And sometimes, you know, it, it's some, some something you'll learn. Oh, why did I think of that before? Well, the problem is we're in the whirlwind. We don't have time to think. I, that's that. the thing. I always say we have our nose so on the grindstone. Right. We don't have time to look up. Right. And that's why I said earlier, it's not just the money that you're investing. You're investing your time. And, and yeah. when you invest that time and you're focused on time away from the business to work on the business. That's right. It's really incredible what can happen. Yeah. It forces you, forces you to work on the business, even if it's an hour a week. Yep. forces you to work on the business instead of in it for that little bit of time yep. and hold you accountable because it's so easy to like say, all right, if you're going to do it on your own, I'm going to study this or do whatever, sit down and work on my plan. It's so easy to go, Oh my God, I don't have time. I'll do it tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. I mean, I'm terrible about that. So if you do have a coach or a mentor that you're working with or a, a mastermind group, that does hold you accountable because you have to go back to somebody and be and tell them why you didn't do what you were supposed to do or didn't show up. That's not fun. <laughs> yeah. And and the neat thing too, is when you are able to step away from things, it, it does a lot for your clients and your business because you're able to be creative. Yes. And the, the creativity is wonderful and that yeah. leads to a lot of success. I love how, putting together two or more brains creates ideas that never, none of those people individually would have ever thought of. Yeah. I just love that. And an Edward Jones guy that we both know, Ryan Garrett, he, his son, Colin is one of my clients. He's an NASCAR driver. Yeah. Ryan and I, Ryan jokes that we, we share half a brain, <laughs> but <laughs> it's crazy we think a lot alike, but just enough differently that our idea that we really can communicate and get great ideas from each other. And it's so rewarding to have somebody that you can talk with that not that thinks like you, but that can appreciate what you're saying and put their own spin on it. It really, because like we said earlier about people who aren't entrepreneurs, they just can't understand why you're going through it. Why are you working so hard? Why, why, why? Just quit and get a job. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of people. You need idea people that go, oh my God, that's so cool. People that know how to think big. That's right. That's right. Yep. And like we were saying, people who have been there before you. Mm -hmm. and, and well, I want to ask you, uh, one of my passions is helping small business owners who know someday they would like to be able to sell their business to retire. And as you know, I'm sure sadly, two thirds of businesses never sell. Mm -hmm. They end up closing down because they haven't been built in a way that they have any value outside of the owner. 
And most of the businesses that sell, that do sell, go for about half of what the owner thinks it's worth because it's like their baby. Um, so I love to use strategy and technology to help people build value into their business, create processes, systems, new products, you know, recurring revenue, whatever it is, depending right. on the industry and the person and, and what they want to achieve. I bet you've worked with entrepreneurs over the years that if you didn't help them do it, you at least saw them building something that they could sell. Absolutely. So what advice can you give to people about that? People that, because this is the thing I see people my age, I'm 60. I tell everybody, I don't care if you know how old I am. I'm 60. And there's so many people that are my age, they're making a lot of money. They're like, I don't need to change anything because I'm making a lot of money. Who wouldn't want this? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, somebody that doesn't want to work all the time because nobody wants to buy a job. So, have you seen some of your clients make changes that you know made a difference in whether whether they could sell or not or how much they were able to sell it for? Yeah, and it's probably the the biggest one is that, that's boy, that's a really good question. I <laughs> um, you asked really good questions. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I would say it's uh, an investment in their people, probably. Great point. Yeah, probably most most in their employees and um, trying to build them up so that they can be successful and maybe one day take over the business on their own. Yeah, working out that structure that 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 they'd be able to afford it. That is a great point. So many, and not just entrepreneurs, but also corporate managers. But mm -hmm. so many people are afraid to build other people up too much because then they might not need them and they might leave or hop over them or whatever. <clears throat> but by building them up, they're helping to build you up and the happier they are, the more likely they're going to stay and actually being able to sell to an employee or employee group is yeah. one of the easiest ways to sell a business because you already have them there. They already know it. Right. And, 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 and currently those business owners could probably step away for six months and the business will be just fine. Exactly. I actually have a friend who is a mortgage advisor and he is building his business up for his employees to buy it. And he also, most of his employees are women just coincidentally. So he's really excited about it because in that industry, a lot of the workers are women, but not many of the senior people are women. Yeah. So he's really excited that he's building up this opportunity that these people, all people, but a number of them women will end up being able to buy it. But as he's doing it, part of what he's doing is building things in so that he can step away for further, you know, longer and longer and longer. So that when it comes time, it's like a really smooth transition. That's, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, you, you, so you reminded me, I was, I was telling you about my dad and, uh, we, we just, um, on, on the ocean, on the Jersey shore, uh, where my, where, where they live, uh, we, we made a little plaque for a bench and I just got it. I got the picture. Aww. I got the picture of it today, but on, on the plaque, uh, we put a Beatles little phrase from one of the songs and it's, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And when, cry, Dave. <laughs> oh, that's when I, awesome. Yeah. So, so what, what that means is what you give is what you get. Yeah. And, and so your question about that, you, you made me think that I didn't mean, I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but you made me think about that because uh, that business owner is, is giving to those yeah. employees and setting themselves up for a lot of success. And that's going to, I mean, it, hopefully it makes them a lot of, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I cry easily. And when I heard your daddy, you just know it's fine. I'll be fine. Hopefully. Sorry, y'all. It's a very useful <laughs> cry day. But ho hopefully it, it makes that business owner a lot of money by doing so good for those people. That That's what's yeah. supposed to happen. What, what comes around goes around. Yeah, they're all better off. I'll give you another example. Not sorry. I ask you and then I'm giving the examples. Um, there is a retail store in a town next to ours over a hundred years old, a, um, a apparel store. 
men's apparel mm -hmm. so over a hundred years old. And, you know, um, sorry, businesses like that are really, really hard to keep going now and much yeah. less sell something. But the family that owned it, it was still family owned. And the family that owned it had a young African-American guy working with them. I think he may have, may have still been in high school and they just realized what a talent he had for selling and how much he loved it. And they worked, they and he worked with the Small Business Development Center to develop an exit strategy so that he could acquire this legacy business that has an awesome reputation. And so it, it enabled him to own a business that he never would have he never would have been able to afford to start it on his own. But the other thing is most retail businesses like that wouldn't be able to survive anyway. Yeah. You know? And the fact that the secret sauce, you know, of the way that they had built it and the relationships that they had, they were able to pass along to him. And so that's another thing people have there. That's another example of employees, but also, make use of your small business development centers and, and assets like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What a great story. I know. I just, I just love things like that. And I have a passion for small business because, well, I've been in economic development for 15 years on the board of, and with a lot of economic development clients and stuff. And I see to me, when a small business closes, it isn't just the business. It isn't just the jobs. It's literally part of the culture, Dave. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, most of us grow up and we have certain businesses in our memories, whether it's the local drugstore that we went and sat in the soda, you know, at the soda shop or whatever it is, that we have these fond memories of these small businesses. And when they're gone, it's part of the fabric of your life. Yeah. And my dad owned a music store and he closed it in the 80s when he got sick. And, you know, he couldn't have sold it because malls and all that stuff, you know. And um, I still have people that come up to me and tell me all these stories about going in there and looking at the record albums or him tuning their guitar and taking piano lessons there. And um, I think that was when I first moved back here, it was 20 years ago. And I think that's when I first really started thinking about how important businesses are more on that personal level. Yeah. And, and someone like your dad that took that kind of a risk mm -hmm. up a store like that and what it takes yeah. to keep it going. And keep well, it that's going. another story. Awesome. He didn't actually open it. He was blind and he was going to the school for the deaf and blind in Virginia. And, you know, part of what he studied was piano technician and the man that owned this store was blind. So initially he hired my dad to come down for a summer internship and he never left because <laughs> wow. Mr. Hallett, we called him Papa Hallett. He just liked my dad so much and Papa Hallett didn't have any kids and he ended up keeping him there, hired him full time. And um, when he passed away, he left the business to my dad and the woman that was the bookkeeper. So, wow. um, you know, that's, a, that's another example of, uh, he grew up in like abject poverty mm -hmm. in the mountains with 11 kids. I mean, poor, poor, he would have never, ever done anything like that. So that just shows you a business owner with a heart. Right. Big heart. Yeah. That's true. That's a great story too. Yeah. So can you think of any other stories that you want to share before we go? Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the spot. <laughs> I know. I don't, I, I, I don't know if I can. I just, a couple other things that kind of just hit me while, while you were talking. Um, I, I, I just think as, as a business owner, you know, your, your clients just appreciate you. They, they love you. Um, and you, we, we love our clients. We, we, when, um, and we've been working with some for 20 years and in our office, I mean, it's just incredible the relationships that, that we make. And I, I just encourage business owners to don't be afraid to get close to your clients. They, yeah. they, they want you to be successful. They want to be your friends and like, like your dad. I mean, 
what an important part of the town he was yeah. and, and what an impact he made on those those people's lives and so if you can have that type of a business that that mm -hmm. makes a big impact just by the way you treat people what what a great legacy you're leaving yeah think about your business is bigger than yourself and itself think about the impact that you're having on everybody else and i have to say daddy died in 1995 we moved back up here in 2001 my son was 13 when we moved here so when he was in high school and he was a musician he said to me oh my gosh papa opened so many doors for me because everywhere he would go that there were older musicians that grew up in the 50s and 60s and 70s they're like oh my god you're glenn kipp's son come on in you know and he would end up i mean some of these guys played with like the who and bands yeah. like, they were local guys that went on and played with um you know big bands toured and then moved back when they were older and it was just like rather than it being like you know this who's this kid they were just like oh my gosh this is awesome and they thought it was so cool to have you know glenn's grandson here look who's on here so neat ryan <laughs> ron garrett he goes hey dave love seeing you with one of my fa favorite people ever pretty easy to make or cry yeah ryan knows <laughs> Thank you, ryan. 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 Oh, great to hear from you ryan it's been a long time Ron's awesome. And his son, Colin, is awesome. So I don't know if any of y'all out there are NASCAR fans, but even if you're not, go look up Colin Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. He's a NASCAR Xfinity Series driver, and he races to combat veteran suicide. And he is just an awesome young man. I had never intended to work with them long term, but when I met Colin, I just fell in love with him because he has an old fashioned work ethic. He's only 20, but he has an old fashioned work ethic and he's just a great guy. And we have a couple of announcements coming up soon that I'm really excited about. And they go along with that theme of helping other people and it being bigger than bigger than racing, bigger than entertainment. So and, and that goes to the theme that you were talking about, people wanting you to do well. When I, when I started first started um, talking with Ron about helping Colin, sorry, Ron, he told me, I told Colin that, hey, if he wants to race, you know, blah, 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 we'll help him. But he said, I want him to figure out a way that it can mean more than racing. Because when he's older and he's at the end of his career, I want him to be able to look back and realize that he made a difference in somebody's life in some way. And I think that's a very important thing for all of us to think about. Instead of thinking about money or popularity or whatever, how can we make a difference in other people's lives? Yeah. What's our What's our purpose? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That higher purpose. As a matter of fact, my book that'll be coming out this summer, that's the last chapter in it is having a higher purpose, you know, making it be more about making it be more than about money and not from a mushy gushy angle, but Hey, it makes it a lot more fun if we can actually do things that are bigger than ourselves. Doesn't it? It, it does. Yeah. Yes. That, that's nice. Yeah. And money can be a nice resource to assist with those types of things. Right. Money's awesome. Money is great to have, but if money were the only thing we wouldn't see mega wealthy people, not being happy on um, Ryan said that you've made a huge difference in many lives, including his. Oh, that's so, you know, it's so funny when I met you, right. I'm like, yeah, I met this guy with so Edward Jones. Ron's like, Oh my God. Well, you said, I bet I know him. And I told you, and he's like, you're like, yeah, I know him. that was so wild. Yeah. What a small world. Ryan has made a huge difference in many lives as well. He, more, he more, really more than he, more than he even knows. Yeah, he really has. He's a great guy. And I'm not just saying that, Ryan, because you're on here. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> All nice. right. Well, I've had you. Oh, my gosh. I've had you for almost an hour. So I'm going to let you go. But Dave, I've enjoyed talking with you so much. So I want to talk some more again later and, and pick your brain and, brain and pull out some more stories because you have so many ways that you have learned for coaches or from coaches and ways that you've helped coach other people. And I, I just love sharing information like that. 
That's so, terrific. I, I love to keep in touch and keep the conversation going. So yeah. Lisa, thank you very, very much for having me on as your guest today. Thanks. I really appreciate it. And thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Uh, See ya. Bye. Bye. Talk to you later, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks. You too.